Thank you so much for being on the program and some light at the end of the tunnel, some silver lining on these dark clouds. A January 6th political prisoner has now been freed based on the Supreme Court's review of Section 1512C2. Uh, can you can you um, fill us in as to what's exactly happening here? Right. So the Supreme Court in December announced that they would review the DOJ's application uh, of 1512 C2 obstruction of an official proceeding. This is a common felony. More than 320 January 6 defendants have been charged with 1512 C2. It represents half of special counsel Jack Smith's four count indictment against Donald Trump for January 6. But of course, the DOJ has weaponized that document shredding statute that was passed in the wake of the Enron Arthur Anderson accounting scandal and instead used it to criminalize political dissent. And the idea that if anyone interrupted a meeting of Congress, which think about how often that happens, you have committed this felony uh, that could end up could land you in prison for up to 20 years. So the DOJ has brought this against more than 320, 30 defendants. Um, only one judge has dismissed the count. This is how it finally ended up at SCOTUS. But judges in Washington are so nervous that the Supreme Court will come back, oral arguments are in April, that they will come back, Benny, and reverse how DOJ has applied this. They're getting so nervous about it that defendants are now seeking early release for imprisonment on that count. And a few judges have now released January 6th defendants because there's a strong feeling uh, that, that the Supreme Court will overturn how DOJ has used this. They're also asking DOJ to seek plea agreements on other counts instead of this 1512 C2. So the chief judge, former chief judge recently warned that in June and July, the federal courthouse in Washington could be a disaster with defendants seeking uh, vacating of sentences, plea agreements, mm. convictions, et cetera. And boy, wouldn't that be so well-deserved by more than 15 judges who have allowed this count to go forward. Mm. And you've sat through many of these trials and they are heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. The uh, treatment of these January 6th political prisoners is evil. It is, like a, mm -hmm. it is truly like Gulag-esque. We pray for them and we thank you for your reporting on this. And before we sort of get to more of the Supreme Court taking on Jack Smith, I did want to stop for a second and and because I read the statute, I've read the statute a couple of times and I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, I was physically at the White House when libs, an army of liberal orcs, stormed the White House, broke through the fences, mm -hmm. threw bottles and bricks and everything out of the White House lawn. Donald Trump was taken into a safe room they injured over 400 different security officers, secret yeah. service officers. Like, if you are causing the president's, if you are threatening the president's safety so much that he needs to be taken to a safe room, isn't that obstructing of an official? Isn't everything the president does an official proceeding? Where, Where is the gulag for all these leftist orcs? Well, there is no gulag. And more infuriatingly, Benny, all of those criminal cases, to the extent that charges were brought against what you're talking about, the protesters at Lafayette Square outside the White House in May and June of 2020, uh, after jo George Floyd died. Uh, and this lasted for weeks. I mean, they were destroying monuments. They were burning parts of St. John's Church, which is across the street. And to your point, trying to scale the fence at the White House and yeah. overtake the White House prompting the lockdown of the White House and placing Donald Trump and his family in a secure location. All those charges have been dropped, completely memory hold. Um, and so obstruction of an official proceeding, seditious conspiracy. I mean, you name all of the charges that I've seen in January 6th could easily have been brought against those protesters. But all of those cases were dropped uh, and forgotten in memory hold, even though that happened seven months before January 6th, not seven years, seven months, could easily be bringing those same charges. It really does, like, it really does sicken the soul because it's the same mm -hmm. people, right? It's the same people inside of these institutions and they were there when Trump was there, right? Mm -hmm. It like, it, it leads to a much larger question about the systemic rot inside of the system. I know this is ancient history, but during the Kavanaugh hearings in 2017, mm -hmm. 2018, 
I was physically in elevators when senators were being assaulted. Like I was standing there in elevators with my senator, Chuck Grassley, when libs stormed the elevator and like stopped him from going to a meeting. Like that, that's, 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 that's as much as what happened on potentially January 6th and not a single person was charged. They took over the Senate like a million times. These like lunatic, these unhinged lunatics mm -hmm. and stopped to try and stop Kavanaugh from being put on the court and um, nothing. I mean, I don't, I, for, to my knowledge, not a single person uh, was charged, but uh, apparently you could have charged them with a 1512C2 the entire Easily. time. Easily yeah. and threatening lawmakers and disruptive con conduct in a uh, congressional building. Look, you don't even have to go that far back. You can go back, Benny, a few months. Look at what the pro-Palestinian demonstrators, mm. they did the same thing outside the White House at least twice, assaulting mm. federal officers. They also disrupted numerous times Senate proceedings. Um, they occupy parts of the Cannon House office building, which is forbidden. You cannot... Mm. You can't take over and, and occupy and demonstrate in the Cannon House office building. I personally watched a video of two men uh, coming right in Marjorie Taylor Greene's face, screaming at her. I mean, no one on January 6th got that close to federal lawmakers. Were those men arrested, thrown in a gulag, charged with threatening lawmakers or obstruction of an official proceeding or seditious conspiracy? Of course not. No. So I guess the I'll ask the bigger question after this, because I want to cover what the Supreme Court did with taking up the immunity case. You've been nonstop on this on X. Can you sort of fill us in? It's how we started the top of the show. Obviously, the people that we hate, the, <laughs> the people we dislike the very most are having truly like unhinged therapy, therapy right. couch meltdowns over this. So that means something good must be happening. Exactly right. So yesterday, the Supreme Court granted cert, meaning that they will take up the uh, lower court ruling, both district court and appellate court in Washington, that denied Donald Trump's claims of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution. This stems from special counsel Jack Smith's January 6th indictment, which was handed down on August 1st. Now, I want to disabuse anyone out there. And if you're arguing with someone like Andrew Weissman or Rachel Maddow or anyone who is completely losing their mind on cable news and certainly social media, this case has been fast tracked from the very beginning. Think about this, Benny. Usually the typical J6 case from indictment to trial takes anywhere between 18 to 24 months, especially high profile cases. Judge Chutkin can fast track this and only gave Donald Trump and his defense lawyer seven months between the indictment and the original March 4th trial. What they knew was going to happen in the interim, Benny, is that Donald Trump was going to argue that he is entitled to presidential immunity, which is what he did in a motion in October. Judge Chutkin waited two months. If anyone wants to blame the delay on what's happened here, she waited two months between that motion and handing down her history-making order that claimed that presidents are indeed subjected to criminal prosecution. Now that set in that set in motion then, of course, the appellate process, Jack Smith, and what he himself called an extraordinary request, sought to leapfrog over the appellate court, the standard next routine step for any defendant. He went to the Supreme Court immediately in mid-December and said, this is so important, we need to bypass the appellate court process, ask the Supreme Court to take this up immediately. They denied that request. The appellate court then expedited the case. So Donald Trump filed his appeal December 7th. They held oral arguments a month later. Ben, usually this takes months before this happens. Then a month later, they hand down their opinion, of course, upholding Judge Chutkin's ruling. So everyone is on board denying Donald Trump presidential immunity. This is a matter that has never been addressed by the courts, by the Department of Justice, nowhere. It is unprecedented. So the idea that this should be fast-tracked because the Democrats, never Trump Republicans, the corporate media are so desperate to get an easy conviction in a Washington, D.C. courtroom where DOJ has a 100% conviction rate for January 6 defendants, not a single defendant has been fully acquitted by a D.C. jury. They know this is the easy one. And the Supreme Court said, yes, we will take up this case. We're going to hold oral arguments the week of April 22nd. And then that is now prolonging uh, what uh, all of these, what we call people that we hate, I'll say hate, uh, are 
thought that this would be an easy conviction before the convention in July, let alone before the election. Yes. And now, I mean, now it's seeming like there's not going to be any decision until the end of summer, maybe. And you never know with the Supreme Court, right? Like you, you never really know. So, it, so, so just so, to give people the timeline real quickly, um, if the Supreme Court even comes back at the end of May with a decision, which would be very hasty, um, you have to add three months on to that because Judge Chutkin has said she will give Donald Trump seven months to prepare for trial. Well, they've already cut out more than three months as this appellate process has made its way through the system. So if the Supreme Court comes back at the end of May, she has to add on these almost three months for pre-trial preparation that's been suspended since December. That would move the trial earliest to the beginning of August. If the Supreme Court comes back at June, which is the end of their term, that pushes the trial to the end of September. The trial will be going on in Washington while people are voting, but there's no way the trial will conclude with a conviction before Election Day. And that is what these legal observers like Andrew Weissman finally realize and are um, going crazy over. <laughs> they really are. We played, we played, we, we poured so much salt on them at the beginning of the show. Oh, it, just, it. it was so much fun. So, OK, I want to get to the bigger question here and you and I have talked details quite a bit and the audience loves you and you have such a profound deep well of knowledge about this and you are one of the the only reporters that I know that actually sits through these trials and really watches what's happening and what you're seeing is of course the super state turning on their true enemy which is the American people and they are scared that the American people are waking up to the amount of corruption that's going on and it seems like the regime is crumbling on all fronts James Comer was just on the show uh, a few moments ago talking about the embarrassment of the Hunter Biden uh, Hunter Biden having the FBI come through and like burn one of their sources just to try and protect the Bidens publicly. I mean, it's amazing. You never saw it happen with the Steele dossier when you lied to the FBI, but here we are. And so it does seem like there's a very like real collapse that's happening in real time. And there's like a big containment effort. And uh, the biggest, fe the sum of all fears is Donald Trump becoming president again, and then fixing this system. As somebody who has really been like a mechanic on the inside of this engine and seen it yourself, right? You've you truly like saw, seen how the gears move and work. How does Trump fix it? Right? Like, so what needs to happen? I know it's a big question. We have the time, but what needs to happen so that this doesn't happen again? Not to the left. I don't want this to happen to leftists. I don't want it to happen to people on the right. I don't want it to happen to any American, right? It's like plainly <laughs> evil. So what do we do? Well, look, I have said the real villains here are the federal judges who have allowed all of this to happen, who act as nothing more than a rubber stamp. And I'm talking about federal judges in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, should not have its own federal prosecutor, D.C. U.S. Attorney Matthew Graves. They should not have, certainly, their own FBI office, the Washington Field Office. And more importantly, they should not have their own federal courthouse um, which is uh, the D.C. District Court, D.C. Appellate Court, because they all work in conjunction. Not to root out real crime, say, the crime wave that is taking over Washington, D.C. No, they are using all of that authority to go after Donald Trump, his associates, his family members, and now his voters. Donald Trump, if I were him, and I don't care what the standard or basis is, executive order, day one. The D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office is shut down and defunded from any federal funds. Ditto for the Washington Federal Courthouse. Ditto for the Washington Field Office. We know the rot and corruption. We've seen it. This is also the source of Russiagate. All of the bad things that happen in this country happen right there within a few blocks of each other. Shut mm -hmm. it down. And I'll tell you what, Benny. The Supreme Court coming back and reversing DOJ's abuse of 1512C2 will give Donald Trump and Republicans the best reason to shut down this system because of the lives that they have destroyed, the weaponization of the law, people going to jail, people killing themselves. As you know, Matthew Perna committing suicide after realizing they were going to ask for years in jail after he pleaded guilty to obstruction of an official proceeding. So that will be the basis. That will go a long way and shutting down the, now it will shut down then doing the reverse, but then it just goes to other jurisdictions. So right. that to me would be step number one. Right. Ooh, into my veins.
please. Uh, exactly. uh, and he, you can you can get Julie Kelly into your veins, not in a Hunter Biden way, okay, but like, yeah. not in a, not in a San Francisco street no. corner way, but into your I inbox. My man in class. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> into your inbox. Declassified is the Julie Kelly Substack. Declassified with Julie Kelly. This is the best way to find her work. And also, please follow on X. Did I get that right, Julie? Yes, I believe it's now X. We all have to make. And Benny, I will tell people I'm going to be in a Florida courtroom tomorrow. Judge Aileen wow. Cannon, I will be there covering the latest hearing in the classified documents case uh, and expecting a lot of fireworks in that uh, matter. And the trial set for May 20th, which she may set another trial date in the summer, which will then for sure end any hopes of a DC trial in 2024. Mm. Ah. I mean, it's amazing to it's amazing to see um, the reversals here, and it does feel like there's a shift in a real shift in energy happening. Um, and praise God for that. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Thank Godspeed you. to you. Thank you. Thank you.